Hey guys, and welcome back to our series for JASP. In this video, part 10, we're going to look at correlation. Right. So everything we've been doing so far, if you're watching in our prescribed order, is thinking about two variables, one independent that is categorical in nature for t-tests and ANOVA, and one dependent that's continuous in nature. For the next two videos, we're going to talk about using continuous variables for both of them. Okay, so where are the independent and dependent variables might be continuous. That's especially important for correlation. Right. So mostly we're going to focus on Pearson's product moment correlation. However, there are other types of correlations that you could do. So generally this is denoted as the lowercase letter r, and that just means it's a correlation coefficient. It denotes the two pieces, the strength and direction of a linear relationship. And so it's going to be very important for us to add that kind of assumption to our data. That value can range between negative 1, perfectly negative, positive 1, perfectly positive, and it can be anything in between. The closer it is to 0, the less they're related. So if you get a 0, that means absolutely no relationship. If you get a negative 1, that means perfectly negative. If you get a positive 1, that means perfectly positive. And so we'll talk about the interpretation of each of these. Generally, Pearson's correlations, or correlations in general, are used to discover the relationship between two variables. So you have two things that you've measured on the same people, so that's repeated measures design, so to speak, and you just want to know how are those two variables related. So we could ask the relationship between caffeine and my ability to get these recorded. Right? So the more caffeinated I am, the generally the better I am at finishing these out. Or you can think about sleep and grades. There's lots of these things. So let's look at the assumptions and correlation as I drink my coffee. So a lot of these will hopefully be familiar. So first one, our data should be interval or ratio level. That's true now of both variables. So for Pearson's correlation specifically, we need to have variables that are at least interval in nature. There are other correlations that JASP can do if one of those is not true. So if one of your variables is ordinal, uh, we can switch to a different type. Number two that's kind of new um, that we haven't talked about a whole lot before is linearity. Okay. If we're going to measure the linear relationship between variables and tell you what that relationship is, then we probably need to have an assumption that the data is linear and not curvilinear. And so we'll be able to look at that on a scatter plot pretty easily. Outliers is a, a similar one we've been looking at, so we shouldn't have outliers. And I have some graph pictures that have examples of what outliers look in this type of data. Before, we just simply created box plots and tried to figure out, you know, if that data point was an outlier for that dependent variable. Now we're interested in how they are an outlier on both variables at the same time. Excuse me. All right. Okay, next one is that the, again, sampling distribution is normally distributed, but we'll look at our data to see if we can determine kind of how that data shape looks, right? Um, so one thing, uh, is that now that we have multiple variables, we actually have to assume that those variables are all normally distributed with each other. It's a little harder to test, so we'll just kind of keep working with the simple method. Um, but do know that as sample sizes increase, that assumption of uh, the sampling distribution is normal becomes easier and easier to meet. All right, the last one is a new one, and it's a variation on a theme. So we have been talking about homogeneity meaning that there were equal variances for the dependent variable between groups. Now we have to talk about this new one called homoscedasticity. Okay, and that is a fun Scrabble word. I don't know if you can ever get enough letters to make that on a Scrabble board, but what it says is equal variances in a different form. Okay, so it's that there is equal variance of x for every value of y. So if I look down the, the range of x, there should be an equal spread of y. And so we'll use a scatter plot to investigate that. All right, so quick rules. You can kind of bend these rules that it is fairly robust, except for that first one. 
So if one of the data points is categorical, you should do something else. Okay, one of the variables. All right, now for null and research hypotheses for correlations, what we want to know is, is the, the correlation different from something? Okay. And this correlation tells us two things, strength, how strong that relationship is, and direction, is it positive or negative? Now, technically this is a t-test uh, underneath, but our hypothesis is really on co uh, the correlation itself. So rho here, this p symbol, is the population parameter, the population correlation coefficient. And a general set of guidelines is that the null hypothesis is that there is no correlation. You can actually change this, much like a um, single sample t-test. We could determine if the correlation is not 0.2 or something, but a lot of times people pick zero, okay? meaning there is no relationship between the two variables. Then the alternative would be that there is a relationship. Correlation is not zero. Now you can pick a directional test here and do that the correlation is negative or the correlation is positive. But again, these guides stick with a two-tail test, but there are options in JASP to switch that. All right. So let's think about how exercising um, can help us prevent illness. Right? So the more you exercise, the less risk you have of suffering from heart disease. And that's because exercising helps reduce um, cholesterol. And so lower cholesterol is always a good thing. So what we want to do here is determine cholesterol concentration and time spent watching TV. Okay. If you are living a sedentary lifestyle and just, just hanging out watching TV, um, I could make a really great Netflix and chill example here, but I don't know how long that, that joke will last. But the idea here is like, if you're just sitting around watching Netflix all day, um, likely you're not also running marathons, so you should have a higher cholesterol. So more TV time, more cholesterol. That implies a positive relationship between the variables. Okay. Um, so, it could be that maybe all of the, the, the sitting and chilling is good for your stress though, because cholesterol and stress are also related. So we could say that, well, maybe all these people who are chilling on the couch know what's up and they have a lower cholesterol because they're not stressed out like the rest of us. So we're not gonna pick a direction, but we're gonna say there's probably some relationship. All right, let's open this up in JASP here. Click on the hamburger icon, click open, click computer, figure out where you have this data saved or whatever data you're working with. And I got my correlation, my two columns here. So time watching TV and cholesterol level. Let's see where we're gonna start. Obviously with our assumptions. So is the dependent variable at least scale? Yep, both of these are ratio. I guess your cholesterol could be zero, but you might be dead. So in theory, it could be zero. I mean, in practice, probably not, but they're both ratio style data. Now, is there a linear relationship between the variables? Let's explain this a little bit more. Okay. Linear relationships make a straight line on the graph. So we're gonna build a scatter plot of X versus Y. And in this case, we're not really predicting which one causes the other. So it doesn't matter which one we put on X and Y, but the line should be straight either way. This here is more of an exponential relationship, so that's curved, it's got a bend in the road, so to speak, and this one is a, um, a squared kind of relationship, uh, and that's also curved. So we don't want these two over here on the right. What we want is a straight line, like on the left. So we really want to just run a scatter plot to um, check this assumption. Now we could make those scatter plots like we did in Excel in previous chapters, however, there are some options in JASP to make these kind of graphs. So let's do it. So we're gonna click on descriptives, descriptives, move both of them over, okay. no split variables because we have two continuous datas. Okay, under plots, now we're gonna click correlation plot. Okay. And that actually gives us 
some really nice, it's kind of a nice correlation density graph. So it actually gives us the distribution plots automatically. So let's look at these. So what it does is it gives me the histogram for time watching TV. So I can actually kind of look at normality too. Um, the histogram for cholesterol. And then this is the bivariate scatter plot, right? Meaning two variables of uh, what looks like cholesterol by TV here. It doesn't print again down here because it's the same graph. Now it does automatically draw a line on there for you. And I would say this is pretty straight. Now the data are pretty clustered tightly together. A lot of these dots are on top of each other. Um, but in general, that's a pretty straight line. It does not curve. All right. So, doo -doo -doo, all this reading stuff, yada, yada, yada. Are there any outliers? Okay, let's work on the second one. So we already have the graph that we need for this, but here's some representations of what types of outliers you might see. So outliers can be far away from the data. Now this line of perfectly marching dots here is not generally what you see on these types of graphs because real people are messier than this. But this idea that there's a dot that's kind of far away from everybody else, okay? That would generally be considered an outlier because on both X and Y, they're really far away. Now these last two boxes are the trickier ones because they're a little bit away from the data um, here on X and Y, but they're in the pattern of the data. Okay. So generally we people, we people, good grief, generally people consider these types of outliers problematic because they don't match either X or Y. Okay. These outliers here sometimes are called discrepant because they're far further away, kind of down the line, but they're not really, uh, they're still within the, what will, the expected pattern of the data, meaning they line up on this sort of invisible line here that we're drawing. Okay. Um, so generally we'd maybe want to figure out and kind of look for people that are, that are in these kind of spots further away from the data. So let's go back up here and look. And we don't really see that. Okay, everybody's kind of tightly clustered together. An example would be somebody who has uh, 210 hours of TV, or <laughs> hours, is that possible? 210 minutes of TV and 3.5 heart cholesterol. <clears throat> All right, uh, normal distribution. So what we're gonna do is just keep working with the Shapiro-Wilk to kind of keep that consistent all semester. So, <clears throat> There's just a note here about how bivariate normality is difficult to assess because that means that I have to think about the, the combination of those two variables and their normality. So this is where really the sampling distribution ideas really help, will help with this. But if we want to test our data, we can use Shapiro-Wilk. And I'm going to change this down here because JAS people have updated since we made this. And as you know, if you watch some of these other videos, we can click statistics and just add the Shapiro-Wilk right here. We don't actually have to hack the t-test anymore. So let me just copy this box. And we'll add that here. Okay. So what we want to do is look at our p-value here. And remember that this is an assumption test. And so if that comes up as significant, p less than alpha, which we might pick as 0.05, that would be significantly bad. So we don't want this to be significant because that would imply that the, the distribution is non-normal. Both of these are greater than 0.05, so we're probably okay. Now you can also do it this way, but that one little button um, in the data area, descriptives area is so much easier. All right, this just re-explains um, Shapiro Wilk and that normality issue in case that this is the first time you've ever seen it but this idea is we don't want to violate this assumption we don't want this to be significant because it would be bad so we could say both variables are normally distributed by Shapiro Wilk's test now homoscedasticity is a little bit harder um, in the sense that there's no p-value for this it's an eyeball test so what we want to do 
is think about the entire spread of y down x. Okay? You don't want this to be shaped like a triangle. I've also been made the joke not to be shaped like a Dorito chip, right? No megaphone cheerleading shapes or other kind of odd, non randomish shapes. That would indicate heteroscedasticity, and that's bad. Okay, so we took that scatter plot, and then in Word, we just kind of like drew a line around it. Okay. And um, what that would to, to me imply is that is a kind of a fairly even square. Uh, that's a rectangle, not a square. <laughs> a fairly even distribution, right? So the spread here of this box is the same all the way down x and all the way down y. Okay, so it's a pretty even box. <clears throat> Excuse me. What you don't want to see is that box starting small and making a triangle. Okay, so rectangles, good. Triangles, bad. So here's some examples of some bad graphs okay, taken from the internets, where um, if I drew a line around these dots, okay, we would see that this is a megaphone or triangle shape. Same thing here. The dots are fairly close and they spread out. Um, on either side of X and Y here. So you don't want to see the spread change down the variable. So it's okay that there are dots that are further away from the line here because there's a fairly even spread all the way down X and Y. All right, to get the actual correlation, what we're gonna do is click on regression and then correlation matrix. Move over uh, both variables. And we already have kind of our variable correlation matrix going on here, but let's see what else we need to pick. Okay. Spearmans and Kindles are two other forms of correlation coefficients. This is generally if you've violated one of the assumptions. Okay. You can ask for confidence intervals if your instructor asks for those. So let's grab those. They're here in our additional options, excuse me, additional options. <clears throat> so, um, display pairwise table is personally is a really great option here where you can kind of make it like not be so big. So we'll check this out. It's got time TV to time TV. Well, that is a correlation with itself. So that's what all the dashes mean. Same thing down here for cholesterol. So it's kind of, this is kind of the SPSS version or more often what you might see in other programs. But if you click display pairwise table, it just shows you each pair one at a time. And it's like much smaller and much easier to read. Okay. So what would I interpret from this? Well, this first thing here is Pearson's R. So that gives us two pieces of information. One, the direction. There appears to be a positive relationship between sitting down and watching TV or just sitting, right? And the amount of cholesterol. So the more sitting equals the more cholesterol and also the direction of that relationship. So that tells us it's about a 0.4 relationship if I round up. Okay, well, we'll figure out what that means in a minute. The confidence interval is also presented here. And so we see it could be from about 0.2 to about 0.5. All right, so as cholesterol, uh, we've got cholesterol concentration increases here as time spent watching TV increases. Um, this idea kind of represents what one might consider a causal relationship. So we say what we're, we're saying, like, because you're sitting, you're getting more cholesterol. But really what we're just suggesting here is that these two things are relatable. Okay. So everyone's heard this phrase, correlation does not equal causation. I would be really surprised if your instructor hadn't said that. And while being sedentary could cause increases in cholesterol, there are lots of other variables too that could cause this effect. And we're not trying to denote cause here. We're just saying that these two things are related. So as spent time, time spent watching TV increases, uh, cholesterol is also increasing. So you just don't want to be like uh, sitting on TV causes increases in cholesterol. Sitting on the TV. Oh, good grief. It's not even that late in the day, folks. Sitting while watching TV causes cholesterol. You don't want to say that. What you want to just say is that they're related to each other. They're increasing together, that sort of thing. Okay. All right, so now let's talk about magnitudes. Okay. 
uh, Cohen again and his guidelines. Um, so generally these also are related to whatever's normal in your field. Okay, and I would say these are pretty normal for psychology, maybe because we really like Cohen. But anything from about 0.1 to 0.3 is considered small. Anything from 0.3 to 0.5 is considered medium. Anything 0.5 and greater is considered large. So if you have memorized the rules for Cohen's D, please note that these are different because Cohen's D can get quite large and R cannot. Okay, it can only go from negative one to one. And these are the absolute values of those. So if I had a negative three, it would still be medium. So our, neg our excuse me, positive 0.371 falls into the medium range. So this is a medium or moderate relationship. All right. So, so far we've only really told people um, and described that relationship. Now the, the significance test is still included here. Right, so here's our p-value. So that p-value, right, indicates that there is enough evidence to support rejecting the null. So it's not likely that this correlation is zero, it's likely this correlation is not zero. Now the cool thing about this is that um, unlike ANOVA, where we had to write multiple sentences, we can get away with just one big sentence here. So moderate positive correlation between time spent watching TV, not sitting on it, and cholesterol concentration in males, and then throw in the correlation. Again, though, remember that the statistical test does not tell me how more it's more important or more significant. Please don't say that. Your instructor will cringe. And what we want to do is consider an effect size. Many people consider R an effect size by itself. There's no need to do anything else. Um, it's We're just done because we have sizes for that, right? But we could also kind of convert this into something similar we did with eta squared. And it's called the coefficient of determination, or R squared. And in the end, you just literally square it. So 0.371 squared is 0.14. Okay. And so that is the amount of variability of them together. So I can say that 14% of the variability in watching TV overlaps with cholesterol concentration. Okay, so one can explain 14% of the other, but explain again gets us back into that kind of causal interpretation. So we could just say that 14% of their variance overlaps, which is not an insignificant amount when we're talking about cholesterol and heart problems. Now, this is made up data, unfortunately, but that kind of this kind of idea does apply to real life. So let's report this all together. And we're gonna go with the same kind of procedures we did before. First, talk about the study. Uh, product moment correlation was run to assess the relationship between cholesterol and time spent watching TV. Tell us a little bit about the assumptions. Uh, analyses appear to be linear, they appear to be normal, and there's no outliers. Tell us about the test. Moderate positive correlation between the two, where there's about 14% of the variation explained. So that general rule will help you write results sections, right? Tell us about the study, tell us about the assumptions, tell us about the test and what it means. So all that together is correlation coefficients, which will help you then move on to regression, which is in the next video.